Before I started the program, I was a uh, Harry mechanic in the Marines. From that, I thought I knew enough about aircraft in general to go and become an AMP and get my licenses. But I want to make sure that I actually know what I'm doing, and I feel this program gives that to me. The skills and the knowledge you come away with here are better, I feel, in this industry than any other a and class that I've taken. A lot of people get intimidated by the level of math and science they think you need to know. But in reality, if you can work with your hands, if you can have an open mind and can learn, you can learn this program pretty well. The job I'm currently working works on a lot of general aviation aircraft, which is a lot of what we do here at Sac City College. I graduated from the school here about 11 months ago, so it made it a really easy transition going from going to school here to going to the workforce because I'd had experiences on all these different types of aircraft. A student who has no, no background in aviation, they can still do very well. When I started the program, uh, I, I had no aviation experience whatsoever. But we assume that our students have no background in either being a mechanic or in aviation. So we take them from knowing nothing all the way up to being ready for their tests and going out in the field and working on aircraft. We give them the skills they need to take the FAA exams. And we've got a 100% track record with people graduating our program and then taking the FAA exams. You learn all kinds of mechanical skills. You learn welding, you learn hydraulics, pneumatics, jet engine theory, reciprocating engine theory, electricity, ignition systems, starting systems, landing gear systems. Every system that's on an airplane, we teach you here in this program. The amount of knowledge that you mass from taking these classes will allow you to take on fields way away from the avionics. So don't think if you take this, oh, I'm just gonna be an airplane mechanic. No, there is a multitude of other stuff that you can do and do really well at. A regular day is just a lot of work and learning new projects and learning new concepts and I do enjoy all the people that I work with. So I have a really good group and the last couple of semesters I've had really good groups of people that have really built me up and helped me with my confidence level and made me feel like I could really do things here. The instructors here are top notch. And the base knowledge that you get is tremendous. They all have different ideas of how to teach, but they're all in the same vein as to the student is the most important, making sure that the student understands the process and making sure that they understand the classes and, and the material that they need so that they turn out the best mechanics they possibly can. It's really difficult to find a job nowadays with just a degree and a piece of paper. Um, but when you do a trade like um, being a mechanic, an airplane mechanic, you have a great skill that you can then take to an employer and say, hey, I have this marketable skill that I'm able to use to help repair your airplanes. And that's something that is really important to employers. They don't care so much about what you know, but what you can do. It's a great career. I love going to work every single day. It is rare that I don't didn't love going to work on aircraft. It's a great field, it's wide open, great job security. Uh, the benefits are incredible, especially if you go to work for airlines. We have students who go to Paris just because they can for a weekend, and it doesn't cost them anything. So, where are you gonna get that? After the program, I plan on continuing on with uh, my piloting career, but with the added benefit of having the AMP, I know more about systems and the areas where I can work or open up more. It can become things like a test pilot or work as a uh, flight check, which is pretty important for aircraft in any industry. Uh, and it, all this stuff pays really well, including the AMPs. So it's a good job to be in right now. Um, I, can, I can tell you from recent experience what happens when you run a, an online program like, the, you know, using Zoom and you teach them all about carburetors and fuel injection, and then they come and see you in a couple months to do the lab project, they don't remember anything. It's just, you know, it's the disconnect between the theory and putting their hands to it. Because 
you know, mechanics, they're, they're like us. We, we like airplanes. We want to work with our hands. We, um, and, and that's how these students think. So I'm happy to say we are back 100% in person um, running the whole program right now. We're running, um, it's a two-year program, uh, summer's off. And we're running in our first year program, uh, our first year students, I think I have about 32, which is a little light. We can go up to 36. I've had up to 40 in the first year. And by the time they get through and the ones that want to continue on, uh, second year has usually about three quarters of that. Uh, they kind of get weeded out through the program, not intentionally, but um, usually self-elected. You know, they realize that it's, it's, a, it's a rather rigorous program. Uh, we have a lot of students who are coming to us who are younger out of high school. It's a very different environment than what they're used to. Uh, you know, day one, I start off with the, the dirty dozen, you know, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, in, and we go over the dirty dozen and what it really means to work on aircraft. You know, that's, if I could instill one thing in, in, in my students, it's I want you to read, understand, interpret, follow written directions, because that is what the FA expects us to do. But we're talking about a generation that's growing up on YouTube, which is very difficult uh, to get them to transition to the fact that, no, you cannot watch a video on how to install a magneto and call that your approved data. It, it, you know, it's great. You can use it. You can learn. But you know, it just doesn't work that way. So, um, you know, there's, there's some challenges in there to get, get our students to do that. Um, but most of them kind of pick it up after a couple of weeks and realize, no, this guy is kind of serious about this is what we need to do. So then we're all on the same page and it, it becomes rather fun. You know, um, I will say that uh, I'm very fortunate that uh, I work with the two other professors, uh, Phil Cypert, Larry Johnson, um, both, I think, kind of uh, well known in the aviation industry. Um, we have a, a couple of um, helpers with us, um, also from the industry, uh, and our students, which we're with for two years. So it's not like a regular school. I mean, these, these students be, become our friends, um, you know, and when we do things together. I, I flew my airplane to school several times and I'd get there earlier and ask, you know, who hey, wants to go for a ride in an airplane, you know, and take them up. And some of these students have never been in a small airplane. Some have never been in an airplane. I took a student the other day for a flight and uh, she was very quiet about it. And I said, have you ever been up in a small airplane? And she says, no, she hadn't. And, and afterwards, somebody asked her and she says, I've never been in an airplane in my entire life. That was her first, first trip. So it was, it was kind of fun. So um, anyway, um, Oh, I had a few notes I wanted to cover. An interesting thing, and this is why I love doing things like this, is because where do our, our mechanics, where are they actually coming from? And I do the, intro, uh, I do the whole first year uh, at school pretty much, and I definitely do the, our introductory program. We have Aero 309 is our two-week intro program, and you have to take Aero 309 before you can get into the program. It's kind of a get to know us, is this going to work for you kind of a thing. And we hit them with electricity right off the bat. So it's, if you hate electricity, you kind of learn that quickly. And, and uh, usually that makes people change their mind. Not, not the intention, but it's just kind of electricity is the make or break for a lot of people. So we start with that. But I always have a little um, you know, a survey I do with them, informal, I write it up on the board and uh, I can nail it down to, you know, we have five groups. Where did you hear about our school and what made you decide to get into aviation? And you would think with today's, uh, I don't say youth, but that's, that's the word, I guess, um, that most of them would say, I did an online search and found you online and, and, and watched a video and that's what I wanted to do. But 90% or better all say that somebody they knew got them involved in aviation and told them to go to Sacramento City College. It, you know, they got involved in EAA. Um, it was a, a young Eagles flight. It was something like that that got them interested. So, you know, like I said, almost 90%. So it's a huge number of people who um, get involved in aviation simply because somebody took an interest in them and showed them aviation. It, otherwise, it's funny. They don't seem to just get this aviation bug in them to go to uh, A&P school, at least. So uh, any questions from anybody?
guys are quite quiet. Hey, hey, Mark, Mark, I actually have one question. Um, I'm a 74 year old guy, and and I've always wanted to be able to work on my own aircraft, but I, I fear that uh, by the time I get rid of the course, I'll be passing off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, and I talk a lot about, you know, the younger people, but when I look at what our, our makeup is of who our students are, most of them, 75% or more are younger people looking to get into the industry. Some of them are in their thirties or forties, starting a second career. And we certainly have a few that are um, 60s or older who have retired and have finally wanted to get their their AMP license. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the jokes I kind of learned this recently. It was one of those things. It was uh, talking to somebody who, you know, uh, wanted to do something AMP. Hey, you know, well, I'm going to be 76 by the time I get my AMP. Well, do you want to be 76 with an AMP or do you want to be 76 without an AMP? Because hopefully you're going to hit the 76 mark. You know. And so it's, uh, we'd love to have everybody out there. And uh, it's, it is a, a rigorous program. Uh, we don't assign a lot of homework, very little reading at night. And the reason why is because so many of our students actually work. So we're there every day from 3.30 until 9.30 at night. So it's uh, about three and a half, four hours of lab and then two hours of lecture every night, five days a week. And then you also have an option of some Saturdays. We run a Saturday school uh, for makeup time. We call it a makeup time class, but you can come in and, and if you're falling behind, get caught up and, and work with an instructor on Saturdays. So, you know, you're talking six days a week. So it's, it can be a little tiring, but um, yeah, but we do it. We do it. So one of the things that I was thinking about, who wants to sit here and listen to a talking head for forever? <laughs> and, and I would have loved to have you all at the hangar with me, uh, but obviously we can't do that. Um, although we're back in session, we have to wear masks at school. And that's, that gets a little tiresome, but you know what? It's better than not being there by a long shot. A day or two ago, I was thinking about this meeting. I thought it'd be fun to do a walkthrough with you guys. And so I had one of my students, um, I think he's in EAA, Prince, Prince McCoy. I don't know if you guys know him. Um, he, um, he, a very large kid, um, but super nice young kid. And he's actually working out with, um, oh, YOLO, where they're running the Pipistrols. So he's involved with, involved with that. So, but anyway, but I've got this video walkthrough. And I'm not sure if you want to pull that up and we can run that and see what you guys think. Hey friends, I'm Kevin Gehring. I'm one of the instructors here at the Sacramento City College Aviation Maintenance Program. And we're here in my classroom. And what I want to do is give you guys a tour of the facility and show you what you can expect here at our school. So, like I said, this is my classroom over on this side of the building. And on the other side of the building, we have an, another classroom where we have first year students over here, second year students over there. But what I'm going to do, which is more fun, is I'm going to take you across the street and show you what's going on over in the hangar. So let's head on over there. All right, so right now it's a little before three o'clock. Our students are gonna start showing up here pretty soon. We have about 60 students at any given time, usually 30 up to 40 students in the first year and about 20 to 30 in the second year. First year students, uh, they get all the luxury. They're gonna be in the air conditioning and the heat and second year students are out here in the hangar. This right here is our break area. Uh, in case you're interested where you're gonna have your breaks and eat, eat your dinner every night, but come on into the hangar. So here we have our main hangar, and right now out on the floor you'll see a bunch of Cessna 150s. We have our Huey back there, and way in the back we have a V-tail Bonanza. Hidden about outside in various other places, we have a Cessna 310, we have a couple of Cessna 337 Skymasters, we have a Boeing 727, which is we keep over at the museum, so you will be spending time actually at the museum working on the 727 periodically. But uh, over here, we have uh, a series of engines and propellers, and really depending on what we're doing at any given time will depend on the equipment that we're using. So 
We just finished up not too long ago doing engines and propellers, which these would have all been pulled out and you'd be working on these and learning all about propellers. We have over here propeller station where you'd be measuring the propellers and doing all the tracking and uh, we do balance and, and various other things. But I'll take you on into the first year's main lab area, which is locked. All right, so coming on in. Right now, is it's actually the last day of the electrical class. So what you're gonna see laying around, we have alternators, generators, magnetos. These are all the things that students are currently working on. Today's the last day for that. Then starting tomorrow, we reconfigure it and this will be a sheet metal lab. Where we're gonna learn riveting, sheet metal, bending, uh, AN hardware, drill bits, and then we're gonna move on to non-destructive testing. And in a little bit, I'll walk you down to the non-destructing lab, which I'm actually pretty proud of. So through that window right there is where we have our tools and our, our tool room. We have a complete uh, assortment of any kind of tool you could possibly want for working on aircraft. So let's uh, head on out this way. Now, if you look over there, you can see the brake, the sheet metal brake, the sheet metal shear. We've got the Magneto Test Run Center. In fact, we could walk over there a little bit. So we do Magneto say overhauls, because it's a school, so it's not technically an overhaul, but you do a mock overhaul. Uh, and whereby you're going to get to test your Magneto, recharge the rotor, you're going to check the coil condenser. Uh, over here, they're checking the uh, uh, components for leakage. That is the distributor cap they're checking. Over here, we got a student who's actually set up right now. They're checking end play on their Magneto. And so what they do is they actually torque together the Magneto, put the rotor in there. They're going to pull out shims and they're going to put the appropriate amount of shims in so they get the right end play, meaning back and forth. So it should be right by the book and uh, they're gonna set that up and when it's good, I'll check it out, sign them off and they move on to their next step. All right, so over here, we have engine overhaul and accessory area. So what I'll be doing in this station right here is I'll be teaching students how we overhaul cylinders. We're gonna pull out valve guides, put in valve guides, pull out valve seats, put in valve seats, refinish valves, Put them all together, do a leak check, um, even some uh, some honing. So that's the valve station, or the cylinder station, I call it for hot work, for removing valves and seats. We have a valve refacing machine, so we'll reface valves and valve tips. Down on this station, we'll be teaching how to reface valve seats. Moving on down the line, when we do accessories, we teach all about carburetors, fuel injection, fuel pumps, Prob governor, so we have a stand for running fuel pumps and testing them. I've got a mock-up area here for continental fuel injection to show how the fuel injection system works. Carburetor bench where we test uh, float levels and set those up. And a machine over here for propeller governors. So along with that, we've got, of course, a lot of mock-ups over here. On this side, we've got a couple of uh, turbine engines that have been cut away for you to mess with those at some point and all kinds of other stuff we've got going on. Here, we have our non-destructive testing lab where we have brand new equipment that we just purchased and what we'll be doing, this one here is magnetic particle inspection and I'll be teaching students how to do magnetic particle inspection on this machine which basically is you take a part, you run a large quantity of amperage through it, turn the part into a magnet use special fluid that goes over the part, it will indicate any cracks in uh, magnetic material, ferromagnetic material. If it's not magnetic or steel, we would be using a dye penetrant station. Now, if you ever watch Two Frame Roger Rabbit and they dip the, the animals in the, in, the, in the dip, this is the dip. It looks just like it, yes, me. It's just this green fluid liquid. And what that is, is you have a part that might have a crack in it, you put it in there, the dye soaks into the crack, you wash it off, and then the dye seeps back out of the crack. And this is the process for doing that, whereby you dip it, you wash it, drain it, wash it, dry it, there's a dryer right here, we put developer on it, and then we walk into a dark room here, and we inspect it under a black light. So all of this is done in the dark under a black light. And of course, you look around, we have our computer lab in here where you, we did all kinds of computer work. 
One of the fun things about our location is that we're located right here on McClellan Air Force Base. Uh, I think it's the the number one fire fighting area that we have. I don't know the proper term, sorry about that. But anyway, they load all of the heavy aircraft right here. So often you'll see a DC-10 sitting out there. Right now we've got an MD-80, a 737, another MD-80. Um, I forget what that one's called. It'll come in a little bit. Remember what it's called? That one? Um, Neptune. That's it. I remember. And these other aircraft around here are the aircraft that students get to work on. We have a 172 with a diesel conversion, a 150, a Cherokee. We have the 310 back there, like I mentioned, and a couple of Skymasters over in the other area. A lot of this stuff is kind of pushed to side because this isn't the class for it right now. It's sort of in waiting, but eventually when we get to this subject matter, these engines are going to come out. You'll be working on this particular one here, which is an IO520, which came off of a Baron, and so you'll be running an engine like this, running the constant speed propeller. Uh, we have another stand over here. It doesn't have anything on it right now, but at some point in our program, you actually take a light combing O290, you will completely disassemble the O290, put it back together, doing a mock overhaul, then you bring your engine that you put together out here onto that stand and you get to run it, which is a lot of fun to hear something that you put together actually run and make a lot of power. So let me take you over and show you one last room. All right, so one last room to show you. This one is where we keep all of our really nice mock-ups. Now you notice there is stations where we've set up for electrical. We've got oscilloscopes. They're doing an AC project right here. But behind me, we have all kinds of neat mock-ups. This one right here is for cabin atmospheric control systems where you're going to learn about outflow valves, pressurization. We have another one over here for air conditioning systems and air cycle machine. We have another one for serial bus over here. And we have our latest machine right here, which is a mock-up of a 12-volt aircraft electrical systems, whereby students will be learning about all the different components on here, alternators, rate voltage regulators, um, starters, relays, the whole thing. And what's cool about this is we can introduce faults and then you'll be doing troubleshooting on this machine right here. So that's our, our latest one that we just acquired and I'm rather proud of it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I know it was pretty fast and we got a lot more going on, a lot of other projects that are hidden away in various areas waiting to be brought out for each particular subject matter that we teach. But that pretty much is our program and I'm really glad that you guys are having interest and I was able to show you what's going on out here. That That's a tour of our hangar. So questions from you guys or? Yeah, oh, Kevin, I'm yeah. kind of curious. Um, what does it cost for that complete program? Ah, oh, the cost is really low. You know, when you talk about some of these other programs that are 20 plus thousand dollars, we're a community college, which is mostly taxpayer funded. So thank you for all of you. You've already paid for it. Um, so you're looking at about, I want to say it's like $600 per semester. So you're six, 12, $2,400 for the whole program. 24 in wow. total out of pocket yes. is all they would expect to pay. Most students don't pay that. You get a, they get what used to be called a BOG waiver, Board of Governors waiver. They call it something else now, but you have to actually be making some pretty good money before community college actually starts charging you. So for most of them, it's free. Wow. Yeah. And, and is the community um, defined as Sacramento or if you're here in Lincoln, is, are, you, are you eligible to go to Sac Community College? Oh, absolutely. It's a, uh, Anybody in California gets the California rate, which is, I, I should know offhand, it's, it's like $600 a semester. If you're outside of California, it's very expensive. So just a California resident for the past, I think, two years, and you, you're good to go. Uh, we use the FAA books. You don't even have a book cost. Uh, the only costs you really have are you know, a $5 calculator and, and a three ring binder. It's really low. The, the real expense, though, comes in when you get into your testing, because to be an A&P, you've got to take your three written's the general airframe power plant, plus the oral practical. And you're talking about $1,500 for, for all of that. But still, when you compare that to the cost of getting a, a private pilot's license, it's, it's nothing. You know, you spend that much in fuel now. And this is a two-year program? 
Yes, with, uh, and because it's community college, it's summers off. We have two start times, so you can either start in the spring or start in the fall. The only thing is you have to take arrow 309 before you can get in. That's just the one big thing. How long is, is arrow 309 a one semester course in and of itself? Yep, two weeks, two week course. Oh, just two weeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's <laughs> a very a fast paced two week course. We were running it twice a year, once in the summer and then once in January, like the first work day of the new year. And that would prepare students to come into uh, the, the would it be a spring start. But we've changed that this year and we're going to run hopefully two intro classes during the summer. So you, you take the two week intro class in the summer, then you're eligible from then on out to enroll whenever whenever you're ready. Curious what the um, what the dropout rate is. Do you, for the most part, retain the students all the way through? With it used to not be that way, and that's where three hundred nine came in. So three hundred nine, that two week class has a pretty high failure slash drop rate. I, I shouldn't say failure. It's it's almost one of those things. Very few students who stick it out for the full two weeks fail the class. It's like, if they have that kind of an interest, I, I do everything I can for them. Most of them self-elect to drop out at, at uh, it because they just aren't expecting that. Um, they, some people haven't been in school for a long time and they're not quite sure what being an aircraft mechanic is like. Sometimes it's a little bit more of a, here I am, entertain me. And it's, it's, that's not the way it works. And so when they realize that, you know, this is, it, it's serious stuff. Like I said, we start day one with, with some pretty heavy stuff. Uh, if you're not familiar with the dirty dozen, it's, it's the FAA's, um, I'm sort of trying to think what the pilot is. Uh, we have, oh, I forget what the name is. We have what machoism and the other one, I, I forget what the, the terms are, but inside of the dirty dozen, it's, it was Air Canada did this, this study throughout. Oh, I forget what it was. It was actually like the 1970s and eighties. It wasn't that long ago about what caused aviation related accidents. And they came up with, and I don't have the statistics in front of me, but it was, it was pretty bad about how only 12% of aviation related accidents were maintenance related. But of those 12%, it's something like 80 some percent were fatalities you know, and I hit him with this stuff right off the bat. And, and uh, some of the dirty dozen included the, um, what was that the aircraft in uh, Sioux City, Iowa that lost the engine and everybody on board uh, perished on that one. And we talk about that. So, you know, they, they have to come to terms with what it is they're going to do and, and, and get engaged in the seriousness and the responsibility that, that the public puts on us to, to do our work correctly. And, you know, right, right then and there, a lot of them, uh, they're not ready for that. You know, it's, and, uh, but then after that, um, some of them just tend to love it from there. You know, they light up when they, hey, this is, this is what I came for. And so it's, it's really cool. Is, is that uh, introductory course given in the same space that you just showed in the video? Yes, it is. Well, I'm all excited because it's supposed to be, I had to do it online twice. And, uh, and I had to invent this kind of way to do it where I still, they had to do hands-on projects. And these projects, uh, electrical projects where they had to go and I had to put it together, a kit that they could buy on Amazon, uh, a multimeter and a micrometer. And that was a little pricey. It's like 50 bucks for that whole kit and, and uh, resistors. And they would build a, a electrical circuit out of resistors and then I would go into a one-on-one -on -one with them in, in a Zoom chat room, and they would have to show me how they measured voltage, how they measured amperage and, and uh, resistance, and, and we do Ohm's law. And so um, yeah, it's, like I said, it's one-on-one -on -one with the instructor, which is very intimidating for them. Uh, I was a, a former designated mechanic examiner, and, and so apparently I have a... a a bit of an intimidation factor. I don't know why I shouldn't. My daughter is in the class, and, and uh, so it's kind of fun, actually. Would so that could, introductory could, class uh, be beneficial to just uh, aircraft owners who want to know more about their airplanes? I wouldn't want to go through the whole two-year course. Uh, part of it I'd like to do, but how about just the introductory class? Honestly, no, I don't know if, you know, learning more about your plane would actually, if it would work, uh, because electricity is such a stumbling block for so many uh, great mechanics. I mean, and we're talking about a lot of my, our students, they struggle through electricity and they will get just, you know, 
uh, barely scrape through at the C. And then after that, they are A plus students. And these are people you want on your airplane. And so we, I focus a lot on electricity and Aero 309, almost to teach it twice, just to give everybody a, a head start, if you will. So it's really electrical focused. And, okay. and I, I had to pare it down. It used to be a, a great class. We would do sheet metal and engines and all kinds of stuff. And now I really focused it down to just uh, sheet metal and learning how to read a micrometer it, because that prepares them for either going into the, the um, and I think I misspoke, teach them electricity or the micrometer prepares them either to go into the electrical class or the other start is our uh, engine class where we start with uh, micrometering and inspecting a whole engine. So, so if a student happened to own an airplane and lived in Lincoln, could they like fly to McClellan every day and have space on the ramp? Yes and no. Um, there's just enough spot for my airplane. And so, <laughs> so sometimes I fly to work, sometimes Larry flies to work, and sometimes students fly to So it can get a little crowded right there, but oh yeah, we love it when people fly in. So absolutely, yes. You just have to, you do have to be night current because you're leaving at uh, 930 at night. So. Right. Kevin? Yes. Kevin, for somebody that completes your, your program, gets their, uh, their A and P certi certification, what can they expect for starting A? Oh, a, a wonderful question. So what number one, what students can expect from our program is the FAA publishes statistics on every A and P school by quarter, by year. I mean, you go right in there. They, it's, it's not hidden. If you can find this information, you can look at A and P schools. And some of them are pretty dismal. And the FAA breaks it down into... Um, anybody who is below the national average, they will bold, there's 44 subject areas and they will put a bold spot there. You're below the national average. And anybody I think who's uh, below 70, they highlight these numbers in red. Uh, we are above the national average on like everything, but maybe one or two subject areas. And we're still well above passing or at national average. And our, we have a 100% pass rate. So every student who makes it through our program at the end and goes out and takes their test, we have a 100% pass rate. In fact, I tell my students, once you, on, you graduate on a, on a Friday, you should be taking your tests no later than Monday. There's none of this go home and study for a month or two. You know it, you're ready, go do it. And as a, when I was a mechanic examiner, I was not working for the school. And I, in fact, it got to the point where I actually started giving major discounts to Sac City College students because they were so prepared that my day was just an easy day, just a chance for them to showcase their knowledge. So um, I was, I'm very happy about our graduates. But to your question, <laughs> um, starting pay. Uh, we just had a meeting with uh, Hawaiian Airlines, which is not one of the better payers, and it was uh, mid-20s per hour. So the pay is still not great for mechanics, but you know they can expect to be making 50000 a year right out of school. That's not bad. You just have to figure that some of them are living in San Francisco, where it's not, not the greatest. Uh, cost of living is very high, or Hawaii, where the cost of living is very high. So that's, that's the downside. But uh, some of these places that I've visited um, are just amazing. Uh, I went to Gulfstream. They, the Gulfstream had me come out and they wanted to interview a, a whole bunch of uh, A&P instructors and talk about what we could do to entice students to go there. And when they gave a tour of the hangar, it was just unbelievable. I didn't even know such a place existed. You're talking about working in a heated and an air-conditioned environment with all the tools provided for you. Everybody has gigantic snap on tool chests that are matching identical everything is to perfection you know it's just so uh pay wasn't that great but boy it sure was a nice place to work it looked like uh with room for advancement you know i talked to the guy giving the tour and i said you know you're you're a lead mechanic you're in management tell me about you know where you came from he said man i i got my a and p and i just worked here and they said i was doing a great job and maybe a manager you know no uh further education from that so it's wide open could, could you say a little about the, um, the, the experience requirement that the FAA has for a and candidates uh, and how your, does your curriculum satisfy the experience or do they need to go out and have in-shop in 
uh, experience with one of your partners. Okay, so there's two ways to get your AMP. Way one is purely through experience. And oh, I should know this, but um, since I didn't get my, it's like three years, something like three, uh, three years. If somebody knows that off, let me know. Um, working 30 months. At, 30 30 months. It's like 30 30 months for an AMP and I think 18 months for just an A or just a P. I think that's what it is. So, um, but, or you can go to the part 147 school, which is uh, 1,900, 1,900 hours. And at the completion of that, you are eligible to take your test and be a certificated mechanic. It satisfies the whole thing. And your semesters total 1,900 and whatever they need. Yep, that was actually 1,900, and I think we're a little over that. And now, and again, going back to you know working in the field and being a mechanic examiner, the the one advantage that graduates have from the programs that the 147 schools is they're so well rounded, and that they can walk in and take the test on with, with no trouble at all, especially out of our school as versus the, the guys and gals that came out of the military who would have years of experience, you know, five, 10, 15 years of experience would struggle through the A and P test because it's geared so heavy towards, uh, well, first of all, be very well-rounded and the tests, the practical, especially is really geared towards general aviation because we, don't have a 747 that we can ask them to, you know, change igniters on and such, but you can always ask them to put a magneto on. So in that regard, it looks like you have some very specialized test benches, flow benches for fuel injection and, th and rebuilding magnetos. Yeah. Um, do you, how many, I mean, it seems to me, those are the kind of things that it, it looks like you'd know just enough that you didn't want to do that unless you had the really expensive equipment to do it. And so how how many uh, AMPs, this is just your general sense, are generalists who go out and do field repairs as opposed to just swapping out uh, rebuilds from a shop that that's all they do is work on rebuilding magnetos? Well, that's the funny thing. You never know where you're gonna end up. When, when I went to the program and I graduated in uh, 92, I was absolutely convinced that I was going to go work for Delta. And that's, that was, you know, that was the plan. And don't talk to me about magnetos and pistons and, and cylinders because it's not important to me. And where do I end up? You know, out of Clarksburg Air Repair working with Smitty. Um, and uh, if you know anything about that place, we eventually bought all of the equipment that Sacramento Sky Ranch, John Schwanner had brought in the cylinder line, the NDT, and, and I ended up being the engine overhauler, um, working, overhauling accessories, engines, and doing all the NDT work for a very long time and loved every second of it. So I explain that to my students. You never know where you're going to end up. And now I'm watching where they're going. And, and some of them, you know, with social media, the things that they're doing two, two years out of school, I'm just, I'm blown away. I'm like, you know, here's a guy who just installed an entire avionics suite. I mean, you're not I'm talking the nice stuff, you know, the Garmin 750s and, and autopilot who He just himself, you know, installed everything. I had another one I was watching the other day. He just completed doing an engine overhaul on a Cirrus, you know. Um, so they're they're doing some some big stuff out there after a very short period of time. It's hard. I have to warn them, you know, be careful. Don't don't get in over your head. But um, they seem to be doing well. Great. Kevin, I have a question for you. Um... What are you looking forward to with the electric propulsion? Oh, <laughs> um, well, being a piston engine overhaul guy, yeah. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know in Tesla yet either. Um, I just don't know if the battery technology is there yet, but boy, once the battery technology gets there, I think it's going to be very interesting. I'm under, I understand from the student I mentioned earlier that Pipistrol has already got their electrical uh, trainer out there. You know, it's very, very short, but, Boy, it sure makes a lot of sense to me as a, as a primary trainer where the 150s are and now the new light sports. If you could get an electrical version of that and get the cost down, especially with fuel where it is, I think that would be the way to go for, for primary training. I just don't see it as a cross-country plane. Well, I guess more of my question is, is if we start seeing this aircraft come online, you know, over the next five, 10 years, 
How is it going to affect your business? I mean, you're going to have to, FAA is going to have to change the guidelines on training. Is that correct? Well, the FAA has been saying that they're going to change the guidelines for decades, literally decades. And so now we're down to every month. It's, it's coming out next month, guys. It's coming out. And what they want to get rid of is in part 147, where you have this list of everything we have to teach, where it, it, you know, it says right in there, I must teach pressure carburetors, I must teach dope and fabric. Um, and, it, and it really doesn't have much to do with any of the modern things that we're seeing. There's no glass cockpit mandate that we're teaching uh, students how to operate a G1000. And so this is creating a problem. We know it's a problem. And what they want to do, the FA has promised that they're actually going to get away from all of these mandates and simply say, school, you know what to do best. Go do your thing. And if there's a problem, we're going to come knock at your door in a, in a nutshell. And they're actually leaving it up to uh, places like Sacramento City College, where if we want to change our curriculum and we want to say, hey, we want to bring in electric aircraft, we want to start teaching it, we go to our curriculum committee at the college level and say, this is why it's important and get approval from them, which would be easy to do because we're the industry experts. They're going to say yes. And we just do it. And as long as our scores are adequate uh, with, with I mentioned earlier, these FAA um, statistics, as long as our scores are up and adequate, we get to do what we want to do and they won't intervene with that. And I think that's the way to go. Well, well, that's good. Um, you had mentioned earlier at the beginning of your uh, presentation that speaking to a group like us, because a lot of times we have references and we're telling young folks about it. And you're absolutely correct. I, I probably got a half a dozen young men that uh, I'm going to encourage with this. I'm glad it's being recorded. Uh, encourage that this is an opportunity. And I look at it. Uh, is my goodness, you get your AMP and you could pretty much name where you want to live in the United States and well, the world for that matter, yeah. and, and, and have a career and, and a life uh, in a location you would like. And, and furthermore, with the, the return on investment, I mean, it's pretty darn good. <laughs> yeah. It really is. <laughs> um, so uh, I have to thank you for that. With that is, well, listen, Kevin, that's all I have at this point. I'm going to pass it over to anybody else that's got any questions and, and thank you very much it was a very very informative and i'm looking forward to sharing this with uh, some young folks i know thank you oh yeah and you know if you get a group together and you want to come out for an actual tour um it is the only requirements that we have we have to masks and everybody has to be vaccinated so that that did hurt us we lost a lot of students here in the last few weeks because of the vaccine requirement but you know it is what it is right now and uh, yeah, and to speak to, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic career. I mean, I, I love going to work. I still do. And uh, the money isn't the best, but you know, if you can wake up every Hello. day and think, you know, hey, this is a great, great life. And that's wonderful. Uh, Kevin, can mention. you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, um, I've got a quick question. What is required for AMPs? post certification as far as continuing education to maintain currency are there any requirements this is scary but nothing the really? the, the only well you have in the in the FARs you mu must be they can it's it's a self regulated if you have not been active 6 of the last 24 months then you must work under the supervision for somebody for the next 6 months and then you're considered current and as long as you're actively working and there is no hour requirement you know the term working it's like it can be whatever you want it's if you have your own aircraft and you're working on your own aircraft on the weekends that's kind of considered working in the field it's just kind of crazy i that's one thing i would change i would love to see a mandatory i should be careful <laughs> and not everybody's gonna be happy with this one but i would uh, i would highly encourage the faa to have some sort of mandatory requirement you know if you're if you're an ia you have it we have mandatory recurrency for an ia you have to have eight hours of training a year unless you're very busy and you're doing a lot of annuals then you're exempt from it which seems to me like that should be the opposite you know if you're busy you should have more training but that's my soapbox now the other interesting thing is and this is crazy is uh once your certificate it's not a license certificate is issued 
it's just like your pilot certificate. You never have to pay money to keep it up. I mean, it's good for the rest of your life. You just go out and get recurrent. The fact that the government doesn't charge us money every year for that is wonderful. Unusual. I know. Yeah. I've there's other licenses that are not related to aviation. And yeah, the state of California hits me pretty hard every year for, for, for that. You know, I've got a question for you to kind of uh, leverage earlier of uh, owners. Would you ever do something like a, a weekend class of just the kind of maintenance that owners can do um, on, on their aircraft? Yes, that is a great idea. I love that idea because they're always talking about, you know, what else can we do? Um, the funny thing about the colleges, you know, how they look at what we're doing and, and our productivity is what does it bring to the community? Um, one of the things that's the, the biggest thing though, is when we want to offer a new class, they want to know, will this help somebody get a job? So we have to present it in that way, which by the way, our, our newest program that we are starting is the non-destructive testing program using that equipment that I showed you. So we'll have a, a specific program for that geared towards people in aeronautics in the aerospace industry. What, what kind of airplane do you have, Scott? Sorry, no, I, I don't have one right now, but definitely looking down the road. But I would love to go to, you know, a couple hours on a weekend class and see how things work. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I like that. Is, is it also possible if you do purchase an airplane or have one, um, you know, not to bring it down for maintenance, but you know, if you want to hand something over that needs a lot of TLC, uh, can it be one where, you know, the owner is responsible for the cost, but you can use it as a training aircraft to get stuff done on it? Unfortunately, no. Um, litigation being what it is, this will kill you. When I was a student at Sacramento City College, all of those 150s you saw out there were flying operating planes. So when you would go three semesters at the campus in your fourth semester, you would go out to the hangar where these were airworthy aircraft. So you would work on them during the day. And then after class, we would fly them. And the cost was something like $5 an hour wet. And so I got my first 12 hours in one of those planes. And uh, that's how I got my license, or at least got going with my license. It was nearly free, but yeah, we're not allowed to fly them anymore. <laughs> To follow up with from what Scott's asking about um, aircraft owners learning what we can do, one of the things I'm interested in is knowing enough that when I'm working with an AMPIA on the inspection, owner insist, uh, assisted inspection, I understand what he's doing, what he's talking about, and can act as a second set of eyes not with the the license behind me and the and the detailed instruction, you know, training, but enough understanding that I can follow along. That's why I was interested in some sort of training, but not a full two-year program. Yeah. So I'm not you gonna know, rebuild magnetos. I'm not right. gonna rebuild my engine. Yeah. That, and that makes perfect sense to me because I am a huge proponent of uh, owner assisted maintenance. I think the we get owners involved, I think that better decisions are made and the aircraft are safer and it's just a, a better, and it's cheaper, hopefully. So yeah, I'm gonna make a note of that is some sort of owner class. Let's see if I can't get that going. I didn't know I was gonna come here with you guys giving me more work to do, but. <laughs> the other thing you can sell the committee on that is that uh, you're not doing students, so it's zero tuition. You can set that up as a whatever, you know, 59 bucks a weekend so that you've got a guaranteed revenue coming in to cover cost of this. Oh, yeah. Uh, it'd be a very small, um, small unit load or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Send me up. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, yeah, me they too. Don't, yeah, they don't let you bring in your own stuff. And that would be so great if we could uh, run a class, um, you know, you bring in your aircraft and we go over your aircraft with you. Oh, that'd be a blast. Everybody would enjoy that. Could the students do an internship? Yes, absolutely. Um, our students do have, we do have internship opportunities. Most of the time though, they're getting paid. Uh, we don't even call it internship. It's 
Um, the few places that have offered internships, most of the students have turned their nose up at it and said, why would I come work for you for nothing when I've got four places willing to pay me almost 20 bucks an hour to be an intern? So they're going out there. Uh, one of our instructors, he works a lot in the field and uh, he does take students with him and, uh, and lets, him, lets the students work alongside of him out in the field. You know, I don't think he pays them, but he doesn't charge you either. And that's the nice thing. So opportunities, I mean, there's just opportunities everywhere in, in, especially if you love general aviation, you know, just stay in our area and, and uh, there's so many shops that are looking for people. Well, we're just right at the uh, little beyond the top of the hour. So this has just been a wonderful program. And I, I saw lots of smiles of, for people who had the cameras on. And I, I know I was smiling a lot. And it, it's just such a wonderful resource and just shocking what, a, what the return on investment is, how, how <laughs> in, inexpensive. Uh, it's like a, you know, a diamond uh, in our own neighborhood that uh, people don't know that they could get such a uh, tremendous education. Um, so we're going to do our best uh, to steer our, our um, aviation career interested individuals. Not everybody's a pilot and there's a lot of things they could learn. And it's wonderful to know you don't have to go halfway across the country to get an extremely high quality education. Yeah, and if you have the time, there's no better way to work on your own airplane than to be an A&P taking care of your own aircraft. It's, I think it's the only way I can afford my aircraft. There's no way I can do it if I had to take it to a shop. Well, well we can tell you how to build an experimental and then you get a one-time repairman certificate uh, yeah. that <laughs> if it has, has your serial number on it. That works pretty well too. <laughs> I know, gotta be careful. I gotta remember where I'm at here. I'm, I'm a Cessna yeah. guy, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, on that lighthearted note, on behalf of the chapter, uh, uh, thank everybody for coming. And uh, our, our uh, next event, you've already heard Darren introduce uh, our special Saturday morning with Paul Dye. So I hope you all come out for that. And uh, uh, fly safe and keep the shiny side up. Unless you have an airplane where keeping the shiny side up is not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, so everybody. Th thanks right, to everyone. Thank All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.